Amen. I can stand here and honestly tell you that I am the product of a praying mother. Many times I would go home from school, or work, playing with friends, and hear mom praying. It's also an honor today to bring to this pulpit my wife um, and the mother of my children. It's a common occurrence for me to come downstairs, and if she's not reading her Bible or listening to some preaching, she's at the church, as she calls it, Jerichoing around here for you, praying, and, uh, and that's daily. And so I honor her as a praying wife, as a praying mother, as a praying lady. Amen. Let's get behind her today as she preaches the word. What do you say? Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray with her before she preaches, so would you pray with me now? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have spoke a word to her spirit. You have planted it within her heart, and now let the preached word combine with the written word and penetrate the hearts of every hearer. Let us leave here as doers, pleasing you in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's been two years since the last time. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say I'm so honored to be up here again on this Mother's Day. I do not take this lightly at all. I'm not even sure I should be up here behind this pulpit. That's how much I honor it um, and respect it. So I want to give my husband honor, my pastor, this morning. Um, I want to give all our mothers honor this morning. Um, Spiritual mothers, biological mothers, adoptive mothers, mentoring mothers, they all count. They all make a big difference in the life of children. So thank you for that today. Um, I also want to give our pastoral team um, honor today. They are some of the most hardworking, dedicated men and women on the face of this earth. And without you, without them... We would be in trouble. They care for your souls, and many of us have no idea behind the scenes how much they're praying, how much they're just caring about us, and I appreciate that today. God has given me a message for this service. I've carried it um, for quite some time. I wasn't sure where it was coming from, but I, I don't know if it's my schooling. I don't know, I, and, and now I believe absolutely. That's what I thought. Maybe it was just because of the kind of studies that I do. Um, but God has certainly shown me that is not it entirely at all. Um, I just diligently was taking notes and, you know, doing what I needed to do in preparation. Because I'll tell you something, we don't always know when we're going to need the knowledge or the, the words that we get. And so we have to be diligent to be studying and to be doing those things so that when God calls upon us, we're ready with an answer. Um, so the seed was sown in my heart. About two years ago, and I'm going to be very transparent this morning, which is um, kind of hard to do, but I feel like I, I have to do that. I've struggled with God. I can come up here and make you all laugh. And, um, but these kind of sermons, I, don't, I, I didn't want to do it. I fought. I struggled. I argued. Um, but I have to be obedient, and that's, that's where I'm at today. Sometimes before God will allow us, me, the, not that I'm just a vessel, but or the pastors and all that, many, many times, most often, those are birthed from experience, or they're birthed from things. It's like Pastor Lucas always says, I have 10 right back at me. And so before they get up and preach something to you, God has been given it to them. And, been, and so the, the same is true here. Um, so this morning, with the help of God, and the Lord knows I cannot do it without him. This is way beyond my comfort zone. I'm going to speak to you from the depths of my heart about a journey that I have been going through or that I went through um, in my own personal life. And I know that God is going to do some amazing and powerful things in this place. You're not here by accident. I want you to know that. Every one of you, your steps were ordained by God right into this place this morning. And there's a reason for it. The title of my message today is called, Still I Will Trust You. 
So I know we've prayed once, but before we begin again, I'm going to ask you right now to pray that God will allow me to effectively communicate this burden that he has given me. That is the key. You can feel the burden, you can carry the burden, and you can be able to communicate and transfer that. You've got to be able to do that. You can have it up here, you can know what God has said, but if I cannot do it effectively, it's going to just fall on ground that is not tilled and ready to, to hear the word of God. So I'm going to ask you, and in addition to me, I'm going to ask you this morning to pray for yourself. I want you, if everyone would, if you would lay your hand upon your heart this morning and tell the Lord, God, wherever you desire to take me in this service today, I open up those places in my heart to you. Wherever that is, wherever you desire to take me, whatever you desire to do, God, I'm going to go there with you. I submit to your authority. I submit to your anointing. And, Lord, I ask you right now to help me. Let your anointing reach into this congregation today that you would reveal understanding to your people this morning, oh, God. And, Lord, I thank you. I give you the glory because you are going to what you're going to do in this place. And, God, I have felt your power. I have felt your presence throughout this entire service this morning. Every song that was sung, oh, God, I felt your presence. And I thank you for that today. There are a few periods of time in history that are not any more darker and shocking than that of the Holocaust. During this time, concentration camps were established. Jews were pulled from the ghettos and placed into concentration camps where they were forced into slave labor until disease, starvation, or exhaustion killed them. Women and children were gassed. They were shot, and some were even raped. And I'm sorry this is deep today. As the Nazis continued to conquer the new eras and areas in Europe, the new ghettos and concentration camps were set up. And additionally, death squads began to execute Jews and others in mass shootings, burying them in mass graves throughout the continent. Simply put, the Holocaust is one of the darkest periods of our history, filled with senseless and madness and murder. In one of my school assignments, um, we were required to read the book called Night. The story is told of a man named Eli Wiesel. Eli was taken from his home as a young boy, and he endured the torture of Auschwitz. He lost his mother, he lost his father, he lost his little sisters to the torturous gas chambers. Eli recounts the piles of children's shoes that were placed before they were placed into gas chambers. He writes about the beat-up suitcases and the articles of clothing that were stripped off the men and women and children before they were thrown to their death. All of these things, as you can imagine, absolutely stirred my heart. I had a real hard time reading that book. It was not one of my recommended books unless you really want to go somewhere in your mind. Um, but something else happened to me while I was reading that book. Have you ever read a book that something inside of it just like hands came out of it and just grabbed your very soul. That's literally what happened to me reading this book. When I came across the statement made by Ellie Wiesel, this is what he said. He said, I had only lived for God. I had been raised on the Talmud, totally dedicating my life to God. But I will never forget that night. Never shall I forget that smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into reeds of smoke. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God. Moments that murdered my God. I could not get away from these statements. Something was happening inside of me. Why did these words affect me so badly? They were not words that were merely spoken by, a, by an atheist. We might expect those kind of words. Or an agnostic or someone who did not know God. These were not spoken by someone who had just experienced God on a Sunday morning or an occasional Easter service. This man's life was consumed by God's power. His whole life was consumed with the demonstration and the power of God in his life. He was no stranger to the supernatural. He grew up listening to his grandma and his, and his mother, teaching him stories about how the God that we serve will never fail us. The God that we serve will deliver us in times of trouble. He knew the stories about Moses and the children of Israel and how God parted the waters of the Red Sea and drowned their enemies. He remembered the stories of fire falling from heaven. He knew these stories. 
He knew the story of how Daniel was thrown into the den of lions and how God sent, sent down the angels to shut those lions' mouths. He knew that there was one God and that one God would be a personal help and a deliverer in times of trouble. He knew that. That's what he had been raised his whole life, being told, being taught, being spoken to. He knew how to respond when God was active and when God was responding back. He knew how to do that. But what about now? In the face of smoke and crying children and parents and grandparents being tortured, what about now? Mom, you never told me how to respond when God was silent. You never taught me, Dad, how to respond in the season when God is not speaking. Sunday school teacher, youth pastor, mentor. I'm talking about in my own life growing up. You did a great job teaching me how to respond when God is answering my prayers. But what about when he is seemingly silent? We're good at coming to church and putting on the mask. I wanted to have a mask that I could put on. And How you doing, Sister Powell? Well, we're good. Or how you doing, Brooklyn? Good. We're taught that we don't say those things. And I'm not advocating that now every time somebody says, how you doing? Oh, you know, I'm questioning God. I mean, I'm not saying that either. There is proper ways and places of doing that. But we're taught to hold that in. This made me think about my own life. This, this book, if you read it, it will, it will probably bring some things up in, in your life. Could a continual trial become so brutalizing? Could it be so never-ending, so continuous, that the silences of God could actually murder his existence in my life? Could a situation in life really become that devastating? Could a storm become so drawn out and so painful and so everlasting? Could a night become so dark and so long and so void of God's interaction that the lack of him intervening could cause the death or the faith in his own child? I'm not talking to the point that you become an agnostic or an atheist, proclaiming now that there is no God, although there are those that that has happened to. Or that God is dead. That's not what I'm here today to talk about. I'm talking about a certain death that takes place inside a person's faith. You look the same. You dress the same. You fix your hair the same. You pray for people the same. We Pentecostals are really good at knowing when to do the jig and to do the, the right moves and the right words. We're really good at that. We put the masks on and, and to some extent... You know, and when you're in leadership or whatever, we don't get to walk around and be in the molly grubs all the time. We have to do that to some extent. But I'm going deeper than that this morning. We know when to raise our hands and maybe even shout a little bit. You know, them songs that can just get us all going. We know how to do it. We can just stuff everything down. And as we're dancing, we're just shoving stuff down. You know when to shake people's hand and to say, praise the Lord. How you doing? Everything looks the same on the outside. But a portion of your soul has become damaged and wounded and shredded by the disappointment of an unanswered prayer. And when I am referring to the silences of God, I am referring to his unanswered prayer. His word is full of, of his words. God is never silent because if we need the, the, word, the voice of God, we have to just open his word. I understand that. But I'm talking about the silences when we have prayed and we have cried. And God is not answering our prayer. In the secret places of that disappointment, something inside of you and something inside of me dies. That's what happens. That's the real. That's the dirty and the ugly. Oh, Sister Powell, we're not supposed to talk about that today. It's Mother's Day. We're supposed to come and hear a message of faith and hope, and, and God's going to do it. And yes, yes, he is. I believe that. But what do we do in the meantime? We move ahead in life. We just keep going. We keep marching to the, right, to the same beat. We don't discuss things like this. 
for whatever reason, we have been taught to never show disappointment to God. And I am here to tell you, let it be known that I am not here. I would never question the wisdom of God. That is not what my sermon today is about. I have come to expose a greater, a deadlier weapon that is being used in the hands of our enemies. I could put a knife up here, and that's what he's doing. He's walking around with this knife during the seasons of God's silences. If you have lived for God for any amount of time at all and you are honest, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Some of you are there. Some of you are in the pit right now. It's dark, it's lonely, you have no idea what God is doing. You precious saints of God have loved God through great disappointments and pain, not understanding his silence. But because you love God, and because you want to serve him in your heart, you've chosen not to bow to the unwelcomed emotions that have come at times when God does not answer prayer. And because you love him, you're still here. And truth be known, I think every one of us could say that I was a pastor's wife, and that was where I was at. So this morning, if you will open your heart and allow God into those locked places that you have shut out, I promise you, I promise you, precious saints of God, you will be healed and you will be restored in the broken places of your soul that you have never allowed to be released to God. In the midst of that healing will flow rivers of strength and virtue that you are not even aware that you've been a void of. You've been void of. John the Baptist. John, you were the greatest man that ever walked this earth, according to the very words of Jesus. John, you were the one who prophesied so powerfully to the crowds that day that he that comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Even before you knew what the Holy Ghost was, John. John, you were the one who was chosen to have the supernatural encounter that day in the form of a dove that rested down upon you to let you know a special revelation that Jesus truly was the Messiah. You were the one who prophesied so powerfully that day to the crowds that he's coming. You knew this, John. You had great understanding and revelation. John, you were a great and powerful prophet. You were a man of God. That's who John was. But now, John, where are you? You're sitting in Herod's prison. Your feet and your hands are locked in chains. And you're facing death at the hands of your enemy. John, you have prayed and you have cried and you have sought God for deliverance. You have wept and you have cried through many, many dark, lonely nights in that prison cell. You have lifted up and you have released your faith over and over and over and over again. That this mighty God is going to deliver you and he's going to, or he's going to send an angel to deliver you. You have said he's going to come and he's going to answer your prayer. But now, John... All you're hearing are the echoes of his silence. And to make things even worse, it's at the time when you need him most. I think that's probably sometimes the most devastating part of this. Is often that's what we think. That when we need God the most. Just prayers are hitting the ceiling and falling back down to the floor. John, you're getting ready to be beheaded. Oh, and what's that, John? You just got word that a little boy was raised from the dead. Oh, that's right, but you're still in prison. I want you to read with me John's mental state during this time. And we find it in Luke 7 and verse 19. And John, calling unto two disciples, and we know that John was in prison at this time, sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come? Or should we look for another? John, what about all those revelations you had? What about those supernatural encounters that you had, John? Prophecies that you sent forth. Why are you even questioning that now? I don't care how powerful a woman or a man of God you claim to be or are. 
I don't care how many miracles you have seen. I don't care how many foreign fields you have been to. I don't care how many people you have personally seen raised from the dead. There is nothing more powerful that can attack your faith any more than the silences of God. There is nothing more damaging. There is nothing that has the ability to attack and to shred and to rip very chunks of faith like the silences of God. Nothing can be more damaging than truly believing that you are going to see a miracle, than truly demonstrating faith, reaching forth for that miracle. And it doesn't happen yet. You're going to come to my rescue, God. You're going to save my son, God. You're going to save my daughter, God. You're going to heal me, God. You're going to take me out of this storm that I am in. And you believe it. You pray it. You speak it. You, you read the word and you, you truly believe that. But then you're listening and what do you hear? The silences continue. I want you to read verse 20 with me. When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? Look how Jesus responded. And in that same hour, in the moments that I needed to hear something from you so bad, God, this is my answer for you, John, from Jesus. He cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and the evil spirits unto many were blind, did he give sight. Then Jesus answering unto them, then Jesus said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and what things you have heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor, the gospel is preached. In other words, you go tell John that the power of God is still present. It is still operating. It's still active. It's being demonstrated all over this land of hundreds of people. But... I am seeking something in John through the voice of my silence. I am seeking something from John that is greater than a miracle. I am pursuing something in him that reaches far beyond the supernatural. Something that can only be birthed through my silence. And then he stops and he finishes with this statement. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. There are times in our lives, again, if you have lived for God any amount of time at all, and you've ever been in need of a miracle, you have stood in the shoes that John wore that day in the prison cell. Certain moments in life when you have reached out and you have believed for a miracle, but that miracle did not happen. With time, you get over it, kind of. You move on. Life moves on because that's what we do. That's what we have to do. We, we can't, you know, live in a state of that. And so many of us can get ourselves up and we can keep marching. But what happens is we keep coming to church and we, we keep praying. I'm not sure our prayer life, we might be praying, but I'm not sure how effectively at this time. You keep being faithful but something happens inside of your spirit. A portion of your soul is attacked by something called disappointment. And only those who have walked with God, only those who have reached for God in this way can truly know this level of disappointment. In those moments Ellie Wiesel wrote about, when they come into our lives that show up in the silences with the intentions of murdering our faith. But I promise you, saints of God, there is purpose to the reasoning of why they come. Yes. During these times, we all have a choice to make. Everyone has had sorrow. Not at the same level, I acknowledge that. Some of you have faced things I have never faced. And in those moments, those of you that have been through those deep, dark places. You know what I'm talking about when I say you have to make a decision. You have to decide, am I going to charge God or am I not? Am I going to say things that will help or things that are going to hurt? And I don't know at that time that we always have that cognitive ability 
But that's ultimately where it's at. One of the things that you can do that I, I strongly caution you against is that when a season, when in a season of silence, we have got to be so careful with what we say during these times. 2 Corinthians 13 and 1 states, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Good or evil? Truth or untruth? Words that will either heal you or that will kill you. Every word, the Bible says, any word, can be established in my life and in yours. We don't get the luxury of saying, well, because it's understandable or because sister so-and-so has been through that, this is the exception to the word of God. I wish it was because I fear this is where some people are at. They've established words in their life with someone. They take hold and they become rooted in the soil of your soul. These words that you speak. They can become the context of your life simply by being spoken. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It doesn't matter that because you're questioning, you speak things. Is God even real? We know that's, tr that's not true. But when you speak those words, they don't have to be true to become established. Any and every word has the propensity of becoming established in my life. And I don't know about you, but in my life, that's very, very terrifying to me. And I don't use that word lightly. My conversation, whether it's carelessly or thoughtlessly, if it's repeated or endorsed, even by a well-meaning friend or a family member, even if it's spoken in our presence, It could be spoke by someone that is honestly trying to be supportive of us, of you. That word alone is sufficient to establish the word spoken and be the cause of the destruction in my life and in your life. Satan, whose role is accuser, would love to open up the coffins of your spiritual life by implanting disappointment into your mind during the seasons of God's silence. But He's ultimately got you if he can then seal that coffin by getting us to establish a negative word against God during these seasons. What I say, what I allow to be said to me, what is even said around me can go from being nothing more than a flippant word or a flippant statement made, spoken by someone that's hurting, to becoming my very circumstance. Words can go from just being something that we say in anger. And you know what? We've all done it. We all do it. We're human. But we have got to be more careful with the words that we say. We have got to be more disciplined. We've got to think, especially when we're establishing those things in our life. When I say what I allow, again, to be said to me, any of that can establish this for me. Twelve spies reported that the land flowed with milk and honey, with everything God said it was. But when they started talking, <laughs> the people are mighty, the cities are walled, we even saw giants there. We may not even be able to go up against these people. These were stupid words. God had spoken, and then they get amongst themselves and they start yakking. What they were establishing is, God is right about the land, but he's wrong about us. We were in our sight as grasshoppers. Because the words they established, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years while being denied the promises of God. All because they said things they should not have said. Abraham was childless for years and doubted the possibility of God's promise and then he made the mistake of confiding those fears to Sarah. What did she do? She sent him running off to Hagar. And today, because of the ill-advised conversation that was, went on between the two of them, look at the madness in the Middle East today. It all starts with doubts about God and what he has promised. Then when it's sealed, by establishing the word. 
So church, I urge you, I beg you, when in the season of God's silence, be very careful what words you speak. Proverbs 18, 21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Good fruit or bad fruit. You get to choose which fruit you want to partake of. And in my own life, I'm not even sure how much my husband knows. I'm not even sure he can. I'm sure if I, we talked about it, we could recall the day. It was about two years ago, to the best of my knowledge. It might have been two and a half. And I've never questioned God. I don't allow, I'm, I, I am very disciplined in that respect. There are things I, I do control. But I found myself very angry and just like, just, I just was not myself. And, and just, it, I felt like a pressure cooker. And one particular morning, I think it was the night before, we had a doozy of a fight. And it was not real, the words, and it was, you know, yes, pastors and their wives. Our homes sometimes can be troubled as well. Um, and I can't even really tell you what that was about today. I just remember that I was so angry. I was just, I was ready to just, and, and that's not me. I am not an angry individual. But I found myself there, and I, I and in, in my fit of anger, I just, I, I don't, I'm smart enough not to do something stupid. So I got in my, I, I, the van at the time, and I squealed out of there. And somehow I found myself over something they call a lake, which cracks me up, um, on 72nd. I'm not even sure what it's called, but it was a body of water. And I remember when Brother Tony was showing us the city, he would bring us, I said, Brother Tony, I'm from Maine. We have the Atlantic. Don't sell me on your city with these water places because that ain't going to do any good. Um, anyway, I found myself early, early, early one morning. I don't even know that it was really fully light yet. And I just started crying. I started. I will tell you the truth. I screamed. I don't even know. I didn't know what I was even doing. I was just so angry. And, and, and it was, and when I said this to my husband, he said, I, I, what, and I'm sorry, this is graphic, but do you know when you're really sick and you need to vomit? And that feeling that before it happens, that's what I felt like. I, I, it was so, and I cried and I screamed out to God. I was so angry. And all of a sudden, The Lord brought me back 12 years prior to a situation that happened within my family. And I called my sister-in-law and I got permission to tell a portion of her story. The morning was December the 14th, year 2000. My phone rang early one morning and my sister was on the other line. And she said, Shannon, Dwayne's boat has gone missing. Now, Julie is my sister-in-law. Dwayne is her only brother. He was 21 years old at the time. And on that boat was Dwayne, Dawson, who had a two-year-old son, and Michael, who had a six-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. All three were members of the Jonesport United Pentecostal Church, great tithe payers, good men. And she tells me that their, Dwayne was the captain of that lobster boat. And she stated that, Dwayne, that the boat was missing. I am not going to tell you that I had any reaction outside of, oh, okay, God's going to find that boat. There wasn't one second of that God is not going to do this. We're talking about three boys who live in a city or a town, I don't even know if we could call it that, it has like, I don't even know how many people, a thousand maybe, 1,200, okay. The, the United Pentecostal Church, that was one of the first churches that was established. There's fifth gener that church goes back five generations. I did not for one second question whether or not that boat was going to be found with those three boys on it. 
I said, we're going to believe God. We're going to see a miracle. I quoted the word, and I just knew that God was going to find that boat. And while I was concerned, I was not in any, and I, and I told Julie, I said, I'm sorry, Julie. I hope that that's okay. I, I, I just did not feel an al- alarm because I had such a trust in God that the church was going to pray. People all over the country were praying for, for, this, for this situation. And I just knew that, that God was going to do it. He, Dwayne and those boys were going to be found. And that was it. There are no words that, to describe to you my extreme disappointment when that is not the way that the story ended. I remember crying out, God, where are you? God, where are you now? I could not understand, and for weeks, I, w- I just, I could not deal with the fact that we prayed, we sought God, and, and, and God did not do the work. He did not save those, those three boys. And I have watched over the years, Julie was here, many of you met her, um, amongst other losses in her own personal life. I have, I've watched what disappointment can do to somebody. Julie is one of the most wonderful, giving. There is nothing that that girl would not do for you. But I watched disappointment into her heart a bit. And, I, and for years, it, it can destroy you. I'm not sure to this day, 15 years later, that everything is back to normal, but life is back to normal. I did talk to her, and I did want to, this doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I, of course, I was crying on the phone, and, and she said words, she said, Shannon, she said, let me tell you this. Well, the boat, let me explain first of all, the boat went down. They could not find it, and so from December 14th, The Coast Guard, everybody was out looking. They couldn't find it. December 15th, they could not find, or I think they found the boat, but they could not find the bodies. One of them came to shore. So they knew basically where, but they could not find these, at least two of them. And Duane was one that they could not find. And Julie said she cried out to God that morning. And she said, God, if you're not, if if it's not your will to, to, for these boys, Let me at least, let somebody find their bodies. We've got to have closure. December 14th, December 15th. On December the 16th, Rodney Dame, who was Dwayne's best friend when we left Maine, he uh, he was our youth secretary. He took youth president, and my husband left very, very close friends of ours. he's He's a diver. Now, mind you, the Coast Guard has been out for two days looking and looking and looking and looking. And... Rodney said, God, this family needs closure. Please let me find Dwayne's body. And I'm not sure one of the other ones, but that other one may have been, uh, the story doesn't pertain to him. I'm not sure if that, I'm not the timeline, but I know this is about Dwayne. He prayed that prayer, and he said, uh, it was said that a loon came up out of the water, and God said, dive right there. His first dive down, he found Dwayne. She said, God may not, have heard, may not have answered in the way that I wanted him to. But Shannon, she said, I, we needed to have closure. She said, God did answer that prayer. And so in the midst of all the turmoil and the pain and the suffering, she was able to find a little bit of that God did answer, just not in, necessarily in the way that she had hoped that he would. Fifteen years later, I can tell you that town is still grieving. Um, I got online, actually, and I, I, I found a guest book, and they're still, like, his mom is still posting, you know, on his birthday. And it just, I cried and cried like a baby. But you know what? They have, they're marching forward. And we can say, oh, Sister Powell, God's in charge. God knows what he's doing. He's perfect. Yes, 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 he is. That's all true. But what about the times when your prayers line up with God's promises? I don't think that 
they were praying amiss to be praying that God would find those boys alive. That wasn't praying amiss. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. Those are all prayers that line up with the word of God. What about times when you're asking according to his will and you're not praying amiss? All those five generations of Pentecostals in Jonesport, Maine that day and beyond were praying. But they were not praying for anything that God had not already promised and paid the price for. That day by the lake, I wailed like a baby. I sobbed and I cried until I had no more tears to cry. Truth be known, I didn't even know in the beginning what this was all about. This had happened 12 years ago. Why is it coming up now? God brought me back to that day, 12 years prior in the car that day. And I felt again the desperation of what had happened that day on December 14th, year 2000. I was looking to God to be responsive, to be active, to answer a prayer simply because his child was asking him to do so. And as the tears were falling down my face, I looked out my van window and I said, God, why are you bringing me back 12 years ago? Life has moved on. I don't even want to think about those days anymore. Why are you taking me back to that painful day? I've moved on. I felt like I had dealt with it. I had just come to a resolution that God decided not to to answer the prayer the way that so many were praying. And I'm, what I'm going to tell you what happened to me, if I ever heard the voice of God in my life, I heard him that day. The Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to tell me how disappointed in me you were that day. I want you to tell me how angry you are. Not, I thought I was at the stage of were, but how angry you are at me. I said, what? What, God? He said, I want you to release to me all of that disappointment that you have been holding on to inside for so long. But God, I've always been taught, we don't talk to you like that. You're perfect. Whatever you choose to do is the right thing. And I trust you. I could say those words. And I really believe I meant them to some level. I am not supposed to expose disappointment in you because it makes me look like I'm questioning you. But God knew something that day that I did not know. That those disappointments that were buried so deep in my heart and inside of my spirit from 12 years ago were robbing me and they were interfering with my affections for him. Because that's what disappointment does. It breeds insecurity in a relationship. When you're disappointed in someone, you oftentimes, at least I don't, have any desire to be intimate with them. I don't really want to go sit close to someone and talk to them about my deepest, darkest problems when I'm feeling disappointment in them. But God in his mercy that day exposed in me something that, church, I didn't even know it was there. I knew that I was sad, and I remember thinking, I had such childlike faith, and God didn't do it. And, 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 and now, again, it's 12 years on the other end, and, I, and probably emotions had died down a bit. But going back to those days, we had just moved to Caribou. I was not in a good state anyway. I have admitted I didn't want to go to Caribou. When he called and told me that we were going to Caribou, I slammed the phone down on him. I mean, I did. That's how awful I was in those early days. I was, and so here I was in a town I didn't even want to be in. All this was happening, and a lot of stuff was just there. And here I was, a pastor's wife, trying to lead people with all of that junk in my own heart. Now, they didn't know it. I was able to go to church and smile and do the Shannon thing that I can do. But I was dead inside. I was sitting on a church pew. God was not dead, but he was dead to me. I had prayed, I had believed, and he did not answer. When you are disappointed in someone, you're not going to open your heart up to them. And it brought me back 
to a moment in time that Ellie Wiesel described it when a piece of God had died within Shannon Powell. When I believed without a single doubt that those three boys were going to be rescued, and ultimately they were not, a portion of my faith died. And here's the thing. I did not know how to restore it. I knew something had happened to me back then. But we're taught for years, don't let Satan steal your faith. Don't let Satan rob your faith, right? You've all heard that. We say that. Don't let him take it. But what do you do when you have no control over it? Ask yourself that. When you truly know you don't want to think these things, but it's there. I did not know how to restore this broken part of my faith until God showed me. It only can come from release. It has to come through exposure and verbally releasing those disappointments to God. It comes through confession. It's like sins in our lives. How do you rid yourself of them? You, you repent of them and you say, God, I'm sorry. You speak out those things. The pain of that disappointment had been locked inside of my heart for 12 years. Emotions that I didn't even know were locked inside of me started gushing out. All that disappointment that I had carried around inside were being set free. All those tears, that anger, it was like that vomit that I talked about. I was so sick before. And then it all was milk. God got it all. And I, will, I said things to God. Now, this is the difference. I believe, and the pastor, bishop, can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that when we are in the secret place with God and we are at this place in our life, God already knows our heart. He knows the intent. He knows that we're hurting. And sometimes as, as hurting individuals, we say things we don't necessarily mean. And so I said things that day that I'm not proud of, but I said them to God. I didn't go to my husband and establish those words. I didn't go to one of you and establish those words. I got in a secret place with God, and I screamed and I hollered, and it was like vomit just came out of me. But when that happened, it literally, I, I, I did not hear chains breaking, but I'm going to tell you that's what happened. The chains started breaking off of me one by one. As I started, God started showing me these things, and I verbally expressed them, and I said things that I, 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 was, I was angry. I was mad, and all of that just came back. And it was, again, it was like I was, set, I was so free after that day, after God showed up and healed me of my disappointments. I'm going to tell you, TCOO, it's okay to be upfront with God. It's okay to release your disappointments to him and to release to him your grief, to release to him your anger and your frustrations and your confusion about why he is not answering your prayer. When you release those things, this is why. Because when you release those things to him, now he can do something with them. When it's laid out on the table, have you ever been in a conflict with somebody? You're not going to get very far if he's on his side and I'm on mine and he's holding everything in and I'm on my side. No, sometimes things have to get a little testy and sometimes we have to say things, you know, you hurt me. Those words that you spoke to me, Pastor, they hurt me. But you know what? When we plop them out on the table and we, we say, okay, God, here they are, and it's exposed, God can finally do something with that when we give it to him. He's not the kind, he's a gentleman. He's not going to come into your heart and rip it out and say, deal with me. He knows in our relationship, boy, if I'm really mad, not the thing to do to get in my face and say, let's deal with this. I have to kind of be left alone. <laughs> and my, I, you know, I will self-talk. I will say, Shannon, that's really childish. Shannon, that was really stupid. And I, and I get there, and then I will slowly make my way over to him. And, and he's better at apologizing than I am, but I'm trying to do better at that. But think about in your own relationship. When you get things out, when you are able to finally express, you hurt me. When you finally can say those words, they may hurt. But when you get them out there with each other, finally you can deal with that. But we have, in, we have stomped on, the, we have stuffed those feelings so deep down inside of us that God can't do anything with them at that level. When you're angry and you're disappointed, God is not going to come and force you to deal with him. 
He's just not going to do it. That's not the way he does things. Maybe it's not a physical healing for you that you've asked God for. Maybe it's a child that you have prayed for over and over and day after day. And now you're visiting that child in prison. Maybe that child is off doing things that you worry about them for. Maybe it's a marriage that you prayed for over and over and tried to save, but it still ended in divorce. Maybe it's a death that was not supposed to happen, and you're still grieving over that moment. Maybe it's a baby that you have longed for for years, and that miracle has never come. Maybe it's doors of ministry that you thought were supposed to open for you, and those doors remained closed. I believe today, TCOO, and, and you know what? Every one of you have a story. Every one of you, you could put your thing in there, whatever it is. And I believe that today God is exposing things in, in our lives, in the hallways of our mind. And he's revealing them right now that he wants to heal you of. He wants to make us whole. God doesn't want us living like that. He doesn't want us living as a shell that just knows when to move and when to raise our hands. That is, the, that, Satan laughs. We are so ineffective when we live on a pew as a shell of what once was, pretending, being something that we're not. We're not, do you think that Satan laughs? We are no more a danger to his kingdom in that state of mind than, than the drunk down the street. If he can get us in that mentality and in that mode, he's won. Because disappointment with God, I said this earlier, interferes with intimacy. God might not be dead, but you will sit on these pews serving a dead God. And I'm going to tell you, I can speak these things today because while I cannot look at some of you and say, I know that we're, I haven't been where you've been, you know what? I've been through some things myself. And everybody's level of, of hurt and pain is different. And just because maybe I haven't experienced the death of a child, God forbid, I've been through some pretty hurtful things that could have had the same effect. While they may not be as big in scope, it doesn't always take something big in scope to destroy us. Disappointment with God robs us of that little childlike faith and trust that has got to be there to connect us to the very heart of God when we pray. It robs us of that deep heart pouring worship that we pour out to God that binds us to him and feeds faith into our spirit when we are in the midst of a storm. That's what it robs us of. And if we don't have that in our lives, we are not going to survive living for God. You, can, you think that you're sitting on a pew and, and, and doing the right thing, and, and that's true. But that doesn't last. Something is going to come your way that is going to knock you off your heels. If you don't have, that's what I had the 12 years prior. I just was crazy enough to believe that God w could, was going to do it. Can God do it? Absolutely. What I failed to, to consider, God's ways are not my ways. God's ways are not your ways. We, he, his ways are so beyond us. He, he's not in time. We are in time. We are in this one that's how we think because that's how we're trained to think. But God is so not that. And one thing I know is that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. I know that. My season right now might be God's silences. That's what is. But also what I can say is, but God has a purpose. God has a reason. I can still speak faith. I can still speak that even though I don't understand because my mind knows that my ways are not his ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His concern for us is not happiness. It is not that we have a life that is free of all clutter and all things that are not pleasing to us. That is not, not that God doesn't care because he does care about the little things. But that is not his ultimate will in our life. And he is orchestrating our lives every day as we live for him down the path that he wants us to go. And I promise you someday you're going to look back and you're going to understand why God did it. 
You may be in total darkness right now and not have a clue what God is doing. But you've got to have that childlike faith that says, God, I don't understand. I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. But I trust you. I trust you. Disappointment will steal our prayer life. And that probably is where it got me the absolute most. Because you don't want to talk to someone you're disappointed in. You don't have faith in someone that you harbor disappointment with. You don't have that connection and that childlike trust or need to be close to that person when disappointment is in your heart. Why do you think Jesus prayed for Peter's faith? Out of all the things that he could have prayed for Peter, why do you think he prayed for his faith? The bottom line is this. When our faith has been damaged, it's going to affect our love for God. When our faith has been damaged, it's going to affect our relationship with God. That is why we have got to be healed. We cannot walk around wounded, wounded people for God. We are not going to be effective in the kingdom of God if we go year after year after year not being broken and being healed in the way that God would have us to be healed. Today, you will find survivors of the Holocaust who com whose commitment to God went beyond the dependency of him displaying his power in their life. And in the midst of gas chambers and starvation and beatings and hangings and fear and confusion of where God was at that time, there are those who were held to the heart of God by the glue of relationship. And from the ashes of the Holocaust, in the very face of God's most confusing season, in their life, in the very face of all that horror, was birthed the greatest miracle that this century has ever seen. And through the seeds of God's very silence rose the nation of Israel. It came through the dust. It came through the ashes and the horrors of that holocaust. And I'm going to tell you something, TCOO. You can know all about God. You can know that book. You can have it memorized from front to back. You can be a spiritual sniper with the word of God and know exactly when to say what words and what verses. You can be raised in this thing. But you can still miss what this whole thing is about. So I have a question for each one of us here today. Can God trust us with trouble? Can God trust me with trouble? Can he trust me when I don't understand? I had to ask myself these questions. God seeks through his silence for the glue of relationship. The glue of relationship is the thing that God is looking for in every one of us. At this moment in time, it's a commitment that reaches so far beyond the demonstration of his power. It's a commitment that goes far beyond serving him out of a dependency of him answering all of our prayers. It's something that reaches deep into the roots of our soul, and it creates an anchor. Your love for God will create an anchor in you that will keep you through any storm in this life. I don't know. I'm going to tell you the truth, church. I don't know. Why some people pray and get answers, and other people pray and seemingly they don't get answers. I don't know oftentimes why sickness and disease is in some of your bodies and you're not healed, and others stand up and walk. I don't know why bad things happen to good people. I'm not here today to tell you that I have all the answers. I don't. But what I know is that even in the face of God's silences, God does hear our prayers. Sometimes what we perceive as silence, this was another tidbit Julie gave me. I didn't tell her I was going to share it, but I'm going to share it. She said, sometimes what we perceive as God's silence is nothing more than us having too much noise around us to hear what he's saying. Have you ever, I did this to my husband Turn your radio on really loud and try to think. Try to get a thought. You can't. When all the noise in life is happening and this and that, sometimes I do believe God's silence is simply shutting off God, shutting off our radio so that we can connect. We have so much stimuli in this world between our phones and our iPads and our 
our computers and, and our kids, and, and we don't shut things down and listen. Sometimes God says no, and we will say that's the silence of God. Sometimes God says not right now, and we will say that that's the silence of God. And sometimes God is silent. That's true. When it's all said and done, regardless of whether my prayers are being answered, whether they're not, I personally have made up my mind that that's not going to be the determining factor in my life. I continue to make my way to TCOO. I'll find a place in my bedroom and I will pray. And I will say, God, here I am again today. I can't tell you how many times, some of you ladies, and I'm praying for your kids, I have said, God, here I am again. <laughs> Sister so-and-so, you know, prayer request that she has given me. I'm asking you again. Here I am, God. That's how I talk to him. It's quite comical sometimes. God, I, I've asked you a thousand times. But I'm, I'm here again today doing it for you, God. I'm here knocking at the windows of heaven. I'm knocking, God. I'm knocking at the door. Can you answer? Because you said knock and it shall be opened unto you. So here I am. I'm asking you to save sister so-and-so's children. I'm asking you to give this financial need where that person asked me to pray. I'm asking you, God, to do this or that. You said ask and you will receive. So here I am asking. You're not a man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should repent. Have you not said and shall you not do it? Have you spoken and shall you not make it good? I hold God to these promises because I believe, I believe that your kids are going to be saved. I believe that your body is going to be healed. I believe that your womb is going to be opened up. I believe that your, your hurts in life are going to be healed. I believe that that financial miracle that you are in need of is going to happen. I believe those things. No, they haven't happened yet. But here I am, trudging around here. Those of you that got the circle maker, it works. This is my circle right here. I've taken many of these pews now that he switched them. I not much since this, but I, I have circled pews for your families. Situations that you've had, you've asked me to pray for. When I say I'll pray, I pray. And I will circle. I'm Jericho and God, here I am. I'm doing this again. It's great exercise. No, he hasn't done it yet. I encourage you ladies. Generally, the ladies is who I like to be an encourager to. But I want to tell you something else, church. I do that. I speak faith. I, I, I learned the tongue thing a long time ago. But I want to also say this. Last week, one of the days I was in this empty sanctuary, and I was praying for the many needs that you all have. I have needs in my own life, in my own family life. And as I was talking to God, I was walking back and forth right over here. And I was praying, and I was just talking to God and telling him some of the needs that, that are out there. And I was telling him things that have been on my heart, things I've been praying for for a long time, and God has been seemingly deaf to those things. He's not, but seemingly deaf. But all of a sudden, something rose up inside of me, and I said, and I said, I, I think by this time I was over here, and I just was, and talking to God, and you know how it is when you get praying sometimes, and I just started, like, this boldness rose up in me that I, it, it was like, well, I don't even know where that came from. And I felt like one of the three Hebrew boys come upon me that day when they were facing the fiery furnace. And they said, oh, king, we know our God is able to deliver us. We know that. We know that a miracle can happen at any moment. But then they said, but if not. But if not. Let it be known this day, O king, I am not going to serve your God. Something rose up in me that day, and I said, Jesus, I am believing that you are going to answer the prayers for the things that I have been asking you for over and over again. I know that. I know you have the power to do those things. But if not... If I don't see another miracle in my lifetime again, I come to declare to you today, God, that I am not going anywhere. 
I will proclaim life in my situation. I will call those things that are not as though that they are. I don't serve you, God, for your miracles. I don't serve you because you're my healer. I don't serve you because of the things that you do for me. I don't serve you because of your many gifts. I don't serve you because of all those things. I serve you because I love you. I serve you because I need you. I serve you, God, because I cannot go one day without your presence in my life. Those are the reasons I serve you. And in the face of your silence, God, and in the face of your unanswered prayers, I declare my allegiance to you today. I felt God's arms come around me that morning. Right down. His presence engulfed me like a river, and I felt his love pour into my spirit. And I'm going to tell you something today. God is seeking something from each one of us in his silences. God is seeking something that is so much deeper and way more valuable in our lives than a miracle. God is seeking something from us in the midst of his silent season. It's not really about him displaying his power right now. I know that that may rock some of your theology. I am sorry about that. But it's not about him displaying his power all the time. These things go far deeper. He wants to know where you stand. He wants to know what kind of glue holds you to him. What's inside of you? What kind of glue are you made of? Are you dependent upon his gifts? Is that, is that what it's all about? Are you dependent upon the things that he does for you? Are you, are you here because you, you, you look at him like the drive through you, My husband has taught on it and chuckles. You know, God, I'll take a blessing and I'll take a this and, and hold back on the trials and, and all that. You know, is that, is that what we're made of? And so long as that's the case, we're here. Or are you here? Do you stand with him because you truly love him to be sure even with making such declarations there's still going to be days when things seem dark when all of heaven seems to be MIA but I will proclaim like David who had a pure heart and a powerful ministry but he had a troubled mind he candidly characterized his own self in 2 Samuel 3 and 39 with the words I am weak though anointed I will end the sermon today by making some declarations. I did that two years ago, and I'm here to make some more. Regardless of what my circumstances are, regardless of how bad my situation is or how long I have been waiting for God to answer my prayers, I'm going to speak life in the season of my unanswered prayer. So when I am weak, I think I'm going to say I am strong. When I am in trouble, I will instead say, I will say, God is my refuge and my strength, my very present help in time of trouble. When I'm sick, I will say with his stripes, I am healed. I am the Lord God that healeth all of your diseases. When I'm dying, I will say, I know that my Redeemer lives. When I'm afflicted, I think I will say, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. When I am afraid, I will say, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid for what man can do unto me. When my mind is in turmoil, I think I'll say, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. When I'm weary, I will say, The eternal God is my refuge, and my and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy before thee. When I'm overwhelmed, I will say, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me. When it seems that there are those who are against me, I will say, If God be for me, who can be against me? When I'm afraid, I will say, When thou passest through the waters, when thou I will be with you through the rivers. They shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, and neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. If my children are lost or on their way to somewhere else, I'm going to say to the north, give up, and to the south, take, keep not back. Bring back my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And when I don't understand situations, I will say, and we know that all things work together for good. To them, that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. TCOO, I am done, but this is what I'm going to leave you with. We all, whether we have gone through it yet or it's coming, we are all going to go through the valleys of the shadow of death. I, none of us 
are going to be excused from that. Some have gone through, some are going through, some are, we in those times have got to make up our minds. What are we going to do? And you know what? If you make up your mind and you get you some verses and you start, that's what I did. I walked around. I've told you that I have in my youth version, I have like 15 verses in there because my mind was troubled. I have a troubled mind because I'm, that's the heart. You can't trust your heart. The people say, follow your heart. No, it's wicked. It will deceive you. You've got to follow the word of God. And when you follow the mind, you get, so if you're going to, that's what we think with. Get you some scriptures and start walking around and proclaiming those things. Say them. Because you know what? You're not going to make it if you're passive. If you're just letting whatever thought you want to come into your mind. Because you know what? You will die from disappointment in God. Because disappointment turns to bitterness. And, and we know the, the, the cycle. You have to make up your mind. You are not going to allow that into your mind. And how do you do that? You do it with the word of God. I'm not up here talking about positive talk. Well, that's good. No. Do it with the word of God. Get you some scriptures. I can photocopy that. If anybody needs, if you don't get it, you know, every one of us find ourselves in there. We might be this, but the word of God says this. What are you going to believe? All truth is God's truth. Through it all, still I will trust you, Lord. Still I will trust you. Come on. Come down to this altar as they're singing. Come on.